Uh, and <laughs> welcome back. Uh, you've entered into the collab with Goofy Coach Lay over here and Handsome Justice over here, Coach Just. Uh, today, we're going to be going over the importance of hiring a personal trainer. Um, we're going to be using our own training models or, or part of our training models, uh, what we use for our general population clients or our athletes. Um, we're going to be using the NSCA competition periodization model, um, and we're going to be going over the NASM OPT model. Uh, just a general breakdown of both um, the competition periodization or just resistance training model that NSCA uses basically breaks down parts of the season um, in which you have to switch your resistance training up depending on what the goal of the season is. And then as far as our NASM OPT model, uh, it takes um, a breakdown or, or assessment of whatever client you may or may not have and takes them to a progressional model. Um, as of right now, I'm gonna go over the NSCA uh, periodization model and the importance of it. Um, so most people don't know this model. Um, they know the basics about sports being that there's a preseason and an in-season. Um, some people may even recognize the off season um, or the post season, depending on if they're in the playoffs or not. But for the most part, um, you only hear the general population of, of people talking about preseason games and then the in season. So um, for the model that NSEA uses, uh, it's broken down um, into four phases, um, the preparatory phase, first transition phase, competition phase, and then the second transition phase. Now, if we're counting those up, that's four breakdowns or four parts in time where you'd have to switch up your method of training or your, your way of thinking. So in the beginning, I said that most people only know about the preseason and in season. However, there's the off season, preseason, in season and then postseason. So there's a method of training for all four of those parts in time. There's something to acknowledge or, or, or a, a training goal in each one of those phases. And us as training professionals, as coaches, we have to make sure that the athlete is on point with those phases um, throughout the season. And sometimes we have to toggle different objectives based upon how their season is set up. Um, there's some athletes that have to be at tip top shape throughout every single game, like in the NFL, for instance, or there's some athletes that have to be at tip top shape towards the end of the season, like a track athlete, they use some, some different events to kind of warm up throughout the year. And then towards the end of the season, they go to the Olympics or their, their big championship races. And then they have to be in peak peak, peak training condition to run their absolute fastest time. Um, so I'm going to break these down a little bit and uh, give you some insight on what we look at and then how we apply it. So in the beginning, during the off season, no one's really doing much. Um, this, is, this is part of the season where us as coaches, we tell our athletes to make sure that they are cross training or doing some other type of sport, not necessarily going 100% in that sport, but giving their body a different dynamic of direction, focusing on their recovery from their major sports. So some people, if they play football or, or a high impact sport, you could do something that doesn't necessarily have as much impact like volleyball, or you could swim, or you can even play basketball, just making sure that you're safe. Um, along with the cross training aspect, we're also focusing on a little bit of hypertrophy or muscle growth, as well as uh, recovery and, and, and low intensity movement. Um, this is all, um, this is all geared towards the recovery of the athlete, as well as the, the, the maintenance of whatever athleticism they left off the, the beginning of the season with, they left off their season with. We don't want them to regress that much. Obviously it's gonna be a difference between the, their last event and then off season. Of course, you're gonna lose some, but you wanna try and maintain around, around that, that, that realm. And 
me as a coach, I tend to keep all of my sets and reps strict, strictly geared towards that maintenance. So I'm working on the hypertrophy as well as some endurance. So we're looking anywhere from eight to 10, or sorry, eight to 15 reps around about and low weight. And we're just making sure that our volume is a little higher than normal, just to make sure that we can maintain some stuff. But the low weight is going to make sure that they, they're not burnt out. So um, within that preparatory phase, we go through our off season and then we start to get into our preseason. So now there's a focus on, OK, so what are we training for and what are we doing uh, for that training? So we're toggling our training um, trying to be a more specific and we're working on strengthening our athletes for, 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 uh, their, their in the weight room stuff or, or their actual competition. We're not getting right down into the nitty gritty specifics, but we're doing their basic movements like working under the bar, as opposed to doing goblet squats in our off season or, or body weight squats in our off season. Now we're starting to load up. They're getting used to squatting heavy weight, deadlifting heavy weight, and getting close to introducing their, their speed and power stuff, um, which leads me into our next phase, which is our first transition, because as soon as we got done that off-season phase and we started our preseason phase, we started to transition or started to move from that preparatory phase or that preparatory period into that first transition period. So by transition, we're going from that basic strength that we just started on into our power phase. Power phase is where everybody starts to speed up, right? We're trying to go from brolic to brolic and fast. And this is where, this is where our athletes want to get a little bit more serious because they're starting to get ready for the season. If we're working with football or a team that's, that's trying to get right for their, for every single game, then this is where we're kind of speeding up their transition. We're making sure that they can lift that heavy weight towards the end of this period. We're making sure that they can move fast towards the end of this period because they need to be at tip top shape for that first game. And then we go through there. And then obviously after first transition and then after preseason, we get in season or the competition phase. This is where our peaking happens depending on the sport and our maintenance happens depending on the sport. This is where we get down to the nitty gritty. This is where we make the money. This is where we make, make champions. This is where we win games. This is where things get serious. Okay. Um, me as a coach, I take this period, I take every period very seriously, but I tend to keep a, a keen eye on these, these, the, 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 the first transition or that, that power phase leading into a competition phase. And then while we're in that competition phase, you never know how your athletes are going to react to a certain program until after it's done. So me, I tend to reanalyze my athlete's performance, or I take a, I take a keen look at their performances throughout that competition phase, just to see if what they're doing is working, what that peaking is looking like. And then if, let's say, if there's a track athlete and they're leading up into their seasons, is everything moving in a, in a strict systematic order or are there, ten, are there times or distances sporadic? If that is the case, then I toggle my, my programs accordingly, right? So depending on whether they're peaking or not will determine their, their workloads, their volume and and how many sets and reps they're doing. Uh, if they're peaking, then we don't want to have too many sets and reps, but the weight is going to be sub max, like right under maximal within that 80 to 90 range. And we're trying to move it as fast as possible. Okay. Or we're trying to maintain that speed. So we might even go on the lower end after building up, going on the lower end and then maintaining that speed from that standpoint. Or if we already built up that, that power, then we're trying to maintain it. So if so facto, we'll still be in that, 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 that smaller volume range, but we're going to make sure that they can keep it. So we're going to go up just a little bit on the reps just to make sure that they can keep it, they can sustain it, and it lasts throughout the seasons depending on how many events there are. Now, I just said 
a crap ton of things, number one, and people have probably glossed over <laughs> so far in, in, in this podcast. So I'm going to just give a, 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 a summarization of what just happened, right? So we're training so-and-so for their event. Cool. They're in the off season. They're playing basketball. They're enjoying themselves. They're doing a little swimming. They're doing a little dumbbell lifting. They're doing uh, um, a lot of reps, but low weight. But holy crap, preseason's right around the corner. So I, I guess it's time for us to get under some barbells. So now that we're getting into the preseason or the end of the preparatory phase, now we're loading up. Now we're getting heavy on the weights. Then all of a sudden, we got to move faster. So we're now we're in the first transition. So now we're moving faster. Now we're going up into those higher volumes and those higher weights. Now we're going into those, those maximal lifts or trying to lead up to those maximal lifts because it's time to get some money. We're about to get in the season. So then we're in the season. Depending on what sport you're doing, we're either peaking for the season or we're maintaining for the season. Either way, we got to get money. So that's where we change up our lifts. We're either lifting maximal, we're going really, really heavy for one to two reps, or we're going super, super fast for one to two reps. That's if we're trying to peak towards the end of the season. If we're maintaining, then we're going to go relatively heavy, 80 to relatively heavy, 80 to 90%. But now we're doing more reps because we want to sustain. We got to maintain and sustain so we can remain bars. Finally, <laughs> we're either in that championship or you're not. If we're in the championship, then we've entered into that post-competition phase, right? That postseason, postseason. We want to make sure that we're correct for all playoff ships, but that's also sort of the signaling for the end of our year, right? The end of our year, we're not trying to do anything. Active recovery and that's really, that's basically it. I mean, the first transition and the preparatory phase, they kind of combine into one another. And if we're not, if we're not in that, in those playoffs or championships, then we're shutting it down. Boom. Active recovery for a month or a couple of weeks, depending on how long your season is, depending on where you ended up. And then we recycle all of this all over again. Now, if you're a client and you're watching this or you're an athlete and you're watching this, do you think you can remember that? Do you think you can apply that? Do you think you can toggle your training based upon what I just said? If you don't think so, then it might be important to hire one of us. Hmm. But enough about that. Time to go to our NASM OPT model with Coach Lay over here. Everybody, so first and foremost, I want to introduce myself. I am Coach Lay with Magis Athletic Training. Um, Justice with JV Force Fitness has done a phenomenal job breaking that down of the NSCA competition model. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over the NASM OPT model, but before I do, um, I just want to ask a couple questions to to justice concerning uh, some of the things that, that he discussed because he went over such a, a plethora of information. So being that you are a strength and conditioning coach with, with athletes, um, what do you think is one of the number one benefits that athletes get from working with you as opposed to working um, by themselves? Um, I tend to make the program specific to all of my athletes um, or all of, all of their sports or all of, all of what, is, what is required, right? Um, us as coaches, we take whatever information we get or can gather from the athlete, the sport, and our own training model, and then we create a program. Me, I tend to make it as specific as I can to that specific athlete. So I, uh, I assess them appropriately based upon their conditioning, based upon their strength, based upon their speed, and then I gear the program to them. If, if you 
peak at a different time during the season than than X, Y, Z, or if you have no idea when you peak or what your body is doing when you're peaking, or if you're trying to gather strength or you're trying to get faster, then a specific program is what you need. You need someone to assess you personally and then make sure that you can carry whatever it is that you have and gain whatever it is you don't have. And then we maintain that throughout the season or towards the end. And then we get the championships. You get those chips? Get yes, those. yes, yes, yes. I'm not tooting any horns whatsoever. I'm not tooting any horns. Well, um, again, I want to thank you for that excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Um, again, guys, I'm going to go over the NASM OPT model. This is a model that is a, it is a great overall model for the general population. Um, so I'll walk through a few little, a few little parts of that and um, I'm going to walk over a little bit of what it looks like when I first walk into a gym and just see someone training. So generally, uh, generally when you walk into a gym, you'll see somebody doing some sets and some reps, you know, you'll see them doing the barbell, you'll see them doing um, some curls and maybe some back work, maybe some squats. But generally speaking, when you ask them what they're doing or what they're doing or why they're doing it, they'll say, oh, I'm doing leg day, I'm doing chest day, I'm doing arm day, tries, bias, tries and shoulders, X, Y, Z. And when you ask them, they'll be like, well, um, how many sets are you doing? How many reps? And it's generally, oh, I'm doing four sets, 10 reps, four sets, 10 reps. And a lot of times you'll see that people are, you'll see people in the gym five, six, seven, eight, nine months, maybe even years. And you'll see them in there consistently, but you'll see that their body is not changing at all. And, at all. and it's not due to a lack of effort, but it may be due to a lack of understanding. And that's where the importance of a trainer comes in, in into play. So when I think about a trainer, I think about an electrician. Two months ago, I had some had an electrician come in and he had to install a light. Charged mm -hmm. me, I think, $450 to install a light that took him about 20 minutes. And I was like, wow, you just charged me $450 for 20 minutes worth of work. Yep. And what I understood in that moment is the same thing that I understand as being a trainer. I wasn't mm -hmm. paying $450 for his 20 minutes. I was paying him $450 for his knowledge that allowed yep. him to be efficient enough to do that in 20 minutes. So I say all that to say that that's where the knowledge of a trainer comes in, where we have the understanding, the knowledge, and the, and the information to be able to allow you to progress safely and effectively to meet your goals. So when we're looking at the OPT model, um, there's a few things that I, I generally will do with a client prior to me even putting a client under any type of weight. And that is, I will do some type of assessment. Generally speaking, I may do a overhead squat assessment so I can see whether or not there are any muscular imbalances. I may do a Thomas test. I may do some type of balance test. I may be doing some type of proprio receptive test just to see where that client is because you know that as a coach, um, that the number one asset that a that a that an athlete has to his team is what his availability. Availability. Correct. Mm -hmm. You can't win a chip sitting on the sideline. You ain't there. Exactly. Same thing with same thing with 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 a general population. You can't reach your fitness goals if you're always hurt. You can't make it to the gym. If you know you pulled a muscle here, or you're aching here, or you broke this, broke that, tore this, or tore that. So I think that one of the number one qualities or number one importances of a trainer is just number one, to be able to do an assessment to understand what you actually need. Because every client does not need the same thing. And some exercises are not for everyone. So there's many times that, again, one of my number one examples is that generally speaking, a person may come in and say that, hey, I want a big chest, but their shoulders are, are real rounded. 
and they don't understand that by doing a whole lot of chest work, they're just tightening up that that chest. They're tightening up those 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 pecs, and what they really need to be doing is doing a lot of back work to actually pull those shoulders back to get that nice broad chest. So um, again, um, one of the importances of, of, a, of a trainer is just knowing what you should be doing, why you should be doing it, and what you should not be doing. So when we look at the OPT model, um, the very first part of it is just stabilization. Right, so when we're talking about stabilization, we're talking about doing a lot of exercises that may imbalance, that may involve or will involve balance. What do I mean by that? I mean that we may be doing a bar set curl or a dumbbell curl, but instead of doing that in a stable position of standing on two legs, we will be standing on one. What's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is that it's going to as much, much like your, your um, NSCA model, in that preparatory phase, it's doing a lot of neuromuscular recruitment of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system and working mm -hmm. on stabilizing that, that lumbar pelvic hip area to make sure that, again, we are going to get those muscle, muscle fibers firing. Um, then once we go through that phase, uh, we would then go into what is called a three-pronged phase, which is strength. Um, Coach. Yes, sir. Coach. So do you mind, for, for those that are listening that have no idea what you just said about that first phase, do you mind putting it into normal terms? So, normal terms. So, so instead of muscle recruitment, what would you say? So rather than muscle recruitment, what I would say is this, is that because many times you may be inactive, mm -hmm. those muscles are not being utilized. Yep. So now we go into working out and now we had to send a message to each muscle to say, hey, bicep, I need you, I need, I need you right now. I need you to come put in this work. Hey, tricep, I need you to come put in this work. But those messages are sent by your peripheral nervous system, right? So what we're allowing that, that peripheral nervous system to do is to start to work, get conditioned and start to send out those messages. And as those messages are being sent out, and those muscles start to get that, that message to start doing some work, they start to become more efficient at A, sending the message, B, receiving the message, and C, actually working. So we're just getting, we're just getting those muscles to start to fire, to start to activate after, after a long period of, of inactivity. Perfect. Um, so when we go into the next phase, we're gonna go into our um, strength phase. Now that strength phase is gonna have three different phases. So the first part of that phase is gonna be muscular endurance. Muscular endurance is where we're going to start supersetting exercises. Now, one of the common misconceptions in the gym is what is that, what is that actual superset, right? So many times you'll see a person, they may do, they'll say, oh, I'm supersetting biceps. And supersetting biceps to them is that I'm gonna do some easy bar bicep curls mm -hmm. and follow that up with maybe some dumbbell preacher curls. That my friend is not a superset. Mm -hmm. That is a compound set. There's a difference oh my between a compound set and a superset. Preach a, on it. A superset is when you are working two opposing muscle groups back to back. So in this case, if I am supersetting my biceps, then I'm going to do a bicep curl and I'm going yep. to superset that with a tricep extension. 
So now I'm working two opposing different muscles. So what do I mean by opposing? If we look at my bicep, in order for my bicep to curl or act- Flex on them. Contract, yeah, you, you got a lot of flex. But you know, can't buy flex like you, but I'm, I'm trying, sir. Anything. <laughs> so again, in order for my bicep to, to contract, my tricep has to extend. So when I say opposing, meaning that my tricep is trying to oppose my arm moving and my tricep and my bicep contracting. So my tricep has to release and extend so that my bicep can contract. If my, if my tricep does not, if my, if my tricep does not extend, then I can't bend my arm and I cannot contract my bicep. So again, that's, in this, in this particular phase of muscular endurance, that's where we're going to start introducing the common term superset. So again, when we're supersetting here, and when we're talking about muscular endurance, we're talking about those high repetitions that Justice was talking about earlier. In my mm -hmm. case, when we're talking about the general population, I would even go as high as 20 to 25 reps at maybe about 50 to 60% of that, of that client's one rep maximum. So again, we're going to go high repetitions on that first stable exercise. So when I say stable, that's, that's no longer on one foot. I'm going to be maybe on a bench. I may be standing on two feet if I'm doing a bicep curl. I may be sitting somewhere stable and I'm going to superset that with mm -hmm. the unstable stabilization exercise. Mm. So what does that look like if I were to put that together? So I am going to superset maybe a bench press, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a bench press on a bench. That's going to be my stable exercise. And then I'm going to do maybe a uh, single leg RDL or a single leg bent over row, which is an unstable exercise to now work on the back. So again, I'm working two opposing, two opposing different muscle groups. But again, here I'm supersetting an unstable exercise with a stable exercise. So we're, we're going to do that for about four to six weeks. And then from there, we're going to move into our, our hypertrophy phase. So in the hypertrophy phase, that's where we're going to start to bring down those reps. Um, that's where we're talking about that, that eight to 10, 10 rep range, um, eight to 12, maybe. Um, but in this particular phase, again, when we're supersetting, instead of us supersetting a stable exercise with an unstable exercise, I would be, I would be supersetting two stable exercises. Mm -hmm. so, so again, here, if I'm doing, um, again, a chest press, I'm going to do a chest press on the bench and then I may be doing a seated row. So now both exercises are stable and I'm able to start to do more higher base weights um, at a lower volume um, to increase that muscle fiber um, and increase that muscle growth. Then from there, we're going to start to move into our uh, maximum strength phase. So, Again, another misnomer in the general population. Many people don't know the difference between power and strength. Mm. Generally speaking, if I ask a person, what does power look like? They'll say they're strong, right? And they'll say they, they can lift a lot of weight. Ooh, what a stink face. Mm. <laughs> um, and if I ask a person if they're, what does strength look like, they'll give me the same answer. Oh, they're really strong and bulky, blah, 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 right? So you know this, especially being a, a, a strength conditioning coach of, of athletes as, as well as myself, is that mm -hmm. there's a term that's used in baseball specifically to a pitcher. And that is that term called, he's a power pitcher. Mm -hmm. Now, Look at a power pitcher, generally speaking, they're not a big 
statuous person that is very muscularly built. Generally speaking, they are relatively slim, lean, um, but they have the ability to throw a ball very quickly. So you said what? Very what? Very quickly. Oh. Hmm. So the difference between strength and power is velocity generation, the ability to generate force quickly. So if a person is strong, they may be able to bench press 400 pounds, but it may take them about five seconds to move that bar up and down off of their chest. Mm -hmm. Velocity or power is the ability to, ger to generate velocity quickly with a small amount of weight. So that the difference in layman's terms is if I'm bench pressing, me personally, if I'm bench pressing 280, it's going to take me a long time to, to raise that bar off of my chest. I can get it up, but it's going to take me a while because I'm going to, 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 to struggle because I'm at, I'm at my max. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at a power pitcher, he could throw a ball that weighs approximately eight to 10 ounces at 120 miles per hour, 160 miles an hour. He can generate that force and that velocity instantaneously. So when we're talking about um, maximum strength, this is where we're going to start to do some compound exercises. This is where we're going to start to increase the volume. But those exercises or those weights are going to start to come down. Mm -hmm. that, that amount of weight is going to start to reduce part of that one rep maximum. So in this particular case, he may be around maybe 70, 70 to 80 percent of his one rep max where in hypertrophy, he may be more around that 80 to 90% of that one rep max. So then from there, we're gonna move into our power phase. So again, we just explained what power was. Yep. When we're talking about power in regards to exercise, that's where we may get into a med ball toss, wall ball, uh, med ball, um, oblique wall ball toss. So I'm taking a, a med ball and I am going to generate force quickly from the core, from the obliques and throw that ball as hard as I can, as quickly as I can against that wall. But that, but that ball may only be about 10, 15, 20 pounds, which is nowhere close to, to, to my one rep max. But it's, the about, it's about the ability to create force production and velocity very instantaneously. So when you go through all of those phases, all of those phases um, break down to, and, and just to piggyback on you, when we're, when we're dealing with athletes with the OPT model, um, you also have another phase called um, maximum power phases. And that's where you're going to superset a power exercise with a max strength exercise. But when you go through all of those different phases that I just went through, um, which were uh, six to five different phases, when you break that all down to about six weeks each, you know, six, four to six weeks each, we're talking about it's going to take you six to eight months just to get through one cycle of that program. Mm -hmm. You know, so just knowing where a person is and why they should be training in the methodology that they should be training and just to be able to make sure that they are uh, safe and, and, and doing things the way that they should be. I do also believe that one of the greatest, um, greatest assets to a, to having a trainer is, is just having another set of eyes. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times that I've seen clients um, performing an exercise with the improper uh, form 
And when you try to give them the cues, they're like, I thought I was actually doing that. And it's like, no, you're not, <laughs> you know? Um, but, the, but without those cues, they don't understand what they should be feeling. They don't understand what muscles should be activated. They don't understand what it should look like. Um, mm -hmm. And that can lead to long-term injuries. Man. So I have a question for you, right? Yes, sir. So as you were talking about assessments, um, being that I, I also do assessments for my athletes, being that we need to find out what their numbers can and can't be, and we need to figure out what exactly is going wrong with them. Um, for your general population people, or for your clients rather, um, what is your favorite assessment to put them through? Like, and what do you normally find when you put them through it? So I would say that my, my favorite assessment to do is an overhead squat assessment. Mm. Um, an overhead squat assessment is where I'm asking a person to just stand with, raise their hands above their head, face their palms toward me and simply squat. And many times, many, many times, I will see a plethora of different things. The number one thing that I will see is knee valgus. In layman's terms, what that means is that you become knock needed as you begin to squat. So as you squat, your knees start to collapse inward. Um, another thing that I have a tendency to see is um, in a professional term, is an excessive forward lean, which means that as you begin to squat, you can no longer look at the wall, you begin to look at the floor, at the further you go down into your squat, the more and more and more you look downward because you cannot keep your body upright. Um, another thing that I see a lot are tight calves. So as a person starts to squat, their heels start to come up off of the ground. So I see that a ton of times that when it, when I ask a person to squat, they can't keep their feet on the ground. They're up on their toes. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that um, I, I like to, I like to call it, it's the hell to the King movement. And that's when they go to squat, they can't keep their arms up. They start to come down and pay homage. <laughs> <laughs> so um it's very eye-opening for a client because many times they're unaware of that, right? Mm -hmm. I'll ask them to squat and they'll be like, oh, well, this is, this is how I squat and it's normal. And, and then I will demonstrate for them a squat. And I will literally put my hands in the air, put my toes to a wall and I will squat all the way down, you know, but the grass. And they're like, wow, my body's supposed to do that? Yes, your body's supposed to do that. But it can't do that because you have a lot of muscular imbalances. And mm -hmm. if you're not aware of those muscular imbalances and you do X, Y, Z exercises that you see on the internet or you see everyone else doing, it's only going to make those problems even worse. It's only going to exacerbate that problem. So again, um, if I have great thing that I see with a lot of females, mm -hmm. anterior pelvic tilt. Anterior oh pelvic goodness. tilt means that your pelvis bone tilts forward and you kind of like toot your butt, right? Which means that your hip flexors are really, really, really super tight, right? And that your hamstrings are lengthened. I'm sorry, people. I'm tired of people telling me with an anterior pelvic tilt that you got tight hamstrings. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Your hamstrings are lengthened in order to allow the pelvic bone to actually tilt forward. You cannot have an anterior pelvic tilt and have tight hamstrings. It's, it just doesn't work that way. The muscle doesn't work that way. Um, but anyway, what, what women a lot of times I see that they will have an anterior pelvic tilt and I see them doing a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of hip thrust. Mm. Why are you doing 
same hip thrust if you have an anterior pelvic tilt? Oh, because I saw it online. It mm -hmm. looked good. It's going, Look to, good. it's going to give me a booty and blah, blah, blah. Granted, I get all that. But at the end of the day, looking good should never supersede the ability to have functional movement, to be able to walk, sit, run, jog, and just be able to enjoy daily activities with your family because you're able to move. So um, with the general population, a lot of times it's about finding that balance of looking aesthetically pleasing, but still having that functional movement because there's a lot of guys, guys too, you know, they're, they're in the gym, they're pumping it out and they're, they're built. Ask them to raise their hand over their head and raise their hand up. They're like, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You, you can't move. I can't fit in the, the, the camera. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. You know, triceps all up. I mean, you know, uh, all up here. Yeah. So it's like, traps, traps. Yeah. Yeah. Traps. Traps. yeah. Trapezius. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, I had a brain fart. I'm human. But, um, you know, so, you know, for, for me, it's, it's all about that. But it's also finding that balance of, you know, where, what is your goal? Where you are? Where are you currently? Where do you want to be? Doing a gap analysis between where you are and where you want to be. And then I don't want to work from where you are to where you want to be. I want to work from where you want to be to where you currently are. And that will give me the first steps of how to get you to where you want to be. So I'm always going to work in reverse because if I know what it takes to get there, then we can get you there, but we can't start with not knowing what it takes to get you there. Exactly. Well said, sir. Well said. Um, this is definitely a bunch of crucial information. Um, and to be honest, we've only scratched the surface. We haven't gone into true, true, true detail about what we, what we personally do within all of these phases. We do, or, or us, or trainers and coaches as general, um, we go above and beyond throughout all of these phases, even through setbacks, because all of these plans don't have the, the, the setbacks involved in them. They don't have, I mean, they have projections and, and estimations, but at the end of the day, life happens. <laughs> exactly. So if you don't know a, a smidge of this information that we just went over, if you don't already know how to adapt and then continue to move forward with your goal and you feel as though you have a grip on things you are uh mistaken a little mistaken um and with that um i will say that um hiring one of us or even speaking to one of us is extremely important and I feel as though every um, health conscious person or, or activity conscious person um, should find or seek out this knowledge, whether it's reading or listening to a podcast or speaking to a fitness professional like me and Coach Lay. Um, it will make the world a difference. But um, with that, I do believe that it is our time, right? Just about, I just want to add one little piece. So um, gotcha. um, one thing I would add is this, is that you know, even though that you and I both went over uh, the NSCA's model and, and I went over the NASM model, those are only two models out of hundreds of different models. You know, mm -hmm. so, you know, I may use the OPT model for one client, right? I may use the triphasic model for another client. I may use the conjugate model for another client. It really depends on that client and that need that that client may have. 
So um, again, I think that one of the strengths to, to being a fitness professional and a coach is that we are able to really adapt to our client's needs, regardless who that client is. Every client is not going to be the same. So when we're looking at, you know, a lot of those online fitness things and blah, 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 it's like one size fits all. And we, we, we know as fitness professionals, that's, that's the furthest, furthest from the truth, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, also, I think that one of the one of the biggest things that you and I both bring to our clients is accountability. You know, and, and many times that many many times clients really need that accountability from us. Um, so yes, you know. So um, I am going to say, you know, you did a great job presenting tonight, and I really love the information that you went over tonight. Um, Same to you, sir. Same to you. Thank you very much. I learned a lot from you tonight. Um, but next week, we're going to get into a little bit more specifics. Oh, man. So Tell them what we're talking about. Tell them what we're talking about. We are going to talk about why are we warming up? What is the purpose of a warm up? We're going to actually go through what it looks like to actually go through a warm up and what those specific parts of that warm up are. What even is that? Like, what even is that? What, what, what is a warm, a warm-up? Brad, don't you know? Warm, all I got to do is jump up on the treadmill. Let me get on the treadmill for like five minutes before I, before I go pump my weights. I'm warm. Man, all I do is 25 jumping jacks and I'm ready. Oh, just, yeah. That, 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 that's your warm-up? That's, Yo. that's all I got to do to look like you? Listen. Uh, okay. Listen. Okay. I like that warm up. I'm gonna, you know what? You try my five minutes on the treadmill. I try your twenty five jumping jacks. How about that? Sound good to me. We'll have a lift off. All right, cool. Yes, but yeah, sir. We are going to go over um, what it looks like to to actually do a warm up in a, in a proper warm up. So, um, Justice and I are going to give two different styles of warming up so that you guys can get just get a little idea. Um, we really want to thank you guys for for uh, your time tonight. Again, thank you, thank you. please, 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 if you like the content that we are providing, you find that is valuable, please like, share, and subscribe. Also, make sure that you check both myself out and Justice out on Instagram. Justice, your Instagram handle is? JB Force at JB Force Fitness. Cool. And I am at Magis underscore athletic underscore training on IG. You can find me on uh, Facebook at Magis Athletic Training as well. So with that, guys, I want to encourage you guys to always live, love, and train Magis. Good night. Good night.